Hi, everybody. I'm Seema Kumar. I'm the CEO of Cure. I want to welcome everybody to Cure and um, hope you're enjoying this evening. We've got just an extraordinary evening curated for you today in recognition of a very special day and a very special evening. As you all know, we're all here to unite to raise awareness for Rare Disease Day and also to show our support and our care for the people who are their families, their caregivers, and the scientists and the researchers who are working hard day and night to find diagnoses and solutions for these diseases. And so we've got a really excellent program for you. We're going to get into a lot of uh, details in a minute or two. But first of all, I want to welcome up our keynote speaker, and that is Jamie Haywood. Um, Jamie is here, actually uh, came all the way from Boston, braved uh, snowy weather over there, and then the first snowfall here in New York to be with us. Jamie is really a very special person. First of all, he is, um, first and foremost, a brother. Um, and I'll explain that in a minute. He is um, an entrepreneur, uh, uh, an MIT engineer, a founder. He's a CEO of Alden Scientific, um, and he founded Patients Like Me. Um, he founded Patients Like Me because um, looking at his brother suffer from a terminal illness, ALS, his brother Stephen, he worked very hard um, to race against the clock to save his brother. And um, to date, he has raised actually $200 million uh, in, 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 you know, for ALS research. And so I want to welcome him up here. And he is going to talk about, and I'm so eager to hear this, Jamie, because are we ready? Are we ready for the next bio-industrial revolution? Come on up, Jamie. Thank you. And then the PC came along and the entire world opened up. And the PC was the revolution. Good. Right. The PC opened up and made the whole thing the revolution. And uh, that, um, is, is it good enough or not? Yeah. OK. So um, and when that revolution occurred, suddenly everyone was doing everything. And that was a pretty big shift the beginning. And now, if you want a computer program written, does anyone want to go to MIT? Or NASA, or um, and it now it's distributed, and, that, and that's what's happening in biology. And it comes from this sort of change in the way we do things. So let's go through a little bit of the history. So Stevens died. You go to the doctor, you tell him you got three years to live, and I'm figuring out I'm going to change that because I'm, I'm not realistic. And I said, okay, well, how are you going to change that? Well, how do you figure that out? Well, the first thing is to discover something that's going to make it. So you have to develop it into something that's going to work, and then you have to deliver it to him. And, and this is a system, and we actually kind of silo these in the way we do research today. Um, and I'm sure if you describe your enterprise or what you did, you're in one of these box, box, boxes. And you know, we put money in the boxes. 
They don't really talk to each other very much. Um, so how do we discover? Well, we do give or take a million experiments a year. We publish them in journals. Can anyone directly compare the results of almost any of those experiments outside of genetics? Call it Grant. Do that too. But outside of genetics, can anyone compare the results of any of those experiments directly? In general, no. They're all little silos. Some of them have little sparkly ideas that come forward. But we all know the process. Very few of them get to the next stage. The next stage is development. Now, what you have to do in development is you have to convince someone with a lot of money that you've got something that no one else owns that you can protect, that you can develop in a cost-effective timeline and do it. So you've eliminated 95% of the good ideas already. And then whatever you do, you have to add another five to seven years because you're just completely new. But that's what development is. Okay, one more time. Being told my microphone is not working. Is this better? Oh, much better. Okay, sorry guys. Um, to the Donna thing. Um, and so then the last part, and I remember this point when thinking about Stephen, is delivery. So, you know, once you get this drug, surely we're going to measure that it does something in you, right? I, as far as I can tell, I've been, I've been doing healthcare for 25 years now. I think we've gotten to the place where we're measuring how clean the waiting rooms are, how long it is to get to the, but we don't actually measure in a comprehensive way, the way anyone gets, does better or not. And I, I find that kind of um, appalling. I'll, go to, I'll give you an example. If you went to Toyota and you asked them, um, how operational is every water pump you sold five years ago? And they'll have a database, and they'll have every single water pump, they'll have every single time it was serviced, everything that broke on it. They'll have torn down the ones that broke, and they'll be feeding it back to make it so the water pump never breaks again, which is why Toyotas are so reliable, and every other car in the world. And I'm, I'm going to pick on Suma's old employer. So if you ask Johnson & Johnson how many people that they put a $5,000 hip in last year, how functional are they? They couldn't tell you if they were alive. But the water pump cost $15. So it seems to me from an information standpoint, you have to be really committed to not knowing if you can spend that kind of money and not know. And I, I think this is... I want to talk about this because industrialization is what changes this. this is, these, these silos exist because they are profitable in their entities, and, and technology can change that. So um, I'm going to go a little bit of history. So my brother gets sick. I decided to um, figure out how to treat him. So I surveyed uh, every target ever published or suggested, every drug ever proposed or intervention proposed or suggested, every mouse study ever done, and clinical trial ever done, and I put them in a database. And I was kind of stunned that I was like the first person that did that. Like one database that had all that. We linked it, and the drugs were connected to the targets, were connected to the mouse studies. So you could click on a drug, and you could see whether it was studied and what the target was. I'm still, I think, I'm the only disease entity that has that database in existence. Now, that's kind of crazy, because those are the connected things, right? What's an idea? Does it work? You know, does it work in humans? Can we learn anything in common? So then I tested everything. Because you know I'm an engineer and the Henry Ford thing, and I'm like, let's test these in mice. Because my brother's the next thing, and I'm like, I, I, what, I, I asked myself the question, what would make me put a drug in Stephen? And the answer is, at the time, and I'm not going to argue about the quality of mice, mice, mice as research animals for a moment here. But if a mouse lived longer, I would probably give the drug to my brother. So I'm like, okay. So I called Jackson Labs and I said, give me 50 mice a week. I said, you want 50 mice? I told him, 50 mice a week. And he said, until when? And that was 25 years ago, and they haven't stopped delivering 50 mice a week. <laughs> and every single week, a drug goes into mice. So this was the five-year milestone. And we had tested, at that point, 7,500 mice. The rest of the world combined, every drug company, every academic in the world, had only published 2,200. And we tested 250 studies on 120 drugs. We would actually basically done triple the world's capacity in five years, total capacity. And uh, I was trying to find some magic discovery for Stephen in an industrialized way. So this is an example of all the trial drugs that led to human trials. And the red dots are the published studies by academia and some drug companies. And the blue dots were my replications. And that was a little humbling because my brother's now on a ventilator and a wheelchair. And I'm like, this isn't making me feel real good. I'm not liking discovery. I'm not 
not really feeling good about it. It doesn't feel comparable, it doesn't feel valid. You know, a few of those people, the Red Dots, actually managed to get airplanes before their companies tanked. Um, and I, I, there's something wrong with that system that we could know, we didn't know. Um, two of the drugs also kill people faster. So not only the red dyes not help, but they actually made people worse. So we published this huge scandal, Nature Rates editorials, you know, they had to testify in Congress, all this kind of crap, and of course nothing changed. Um, but I did something different. We said, okay, we don't believe anybody else, and let's go buy, uh, the, the time is good, uh, a, a machine called the Gene Titan. It was the first gene chip that really worked. And so we're gonna just, we're gonna measure every tissue in, in the mouse from birth to death, and we're gonna re replicate over the wall and link that accurate, and we're gonna build this nice progressive model of how the disease progresses in animals, and I'm gonna do it comprehensively. So we did that, and the second drug is now a public company. So after 250 failures, the second target out of this became something that's actually a CD40 ligand inflammatory marker that was not indicating the disease. Um, I think it's going to work. The positive phase 2B was pretty good. Um, now, what's the lesson here? Don't believe we know something. Do something at scale, industrially, in the same way, and replicate it. So, we kind of cover discovery, which is mostly about animals and cells and you know measuring things and checking things out and looking at that stuff. But once you've got an idea, what do you do with it? And and um, the whole clinical trial process was bugging me. Like I'm figuring, like this is not like why is no one tracking my brother? Why is no one tracking everyone? Why are we not seeing what works in the real world? So I built a mouse lab for um, human beings, um, and my mouse lab for human beings. I have a big mouse lab, um, and I and I. So I started collecting human beings in this company called Patients Like Me. People think it was a social network. It was not a social network. It was a mouse lab where I could put people in and I would like observe them and test things out and watch them run wheels. So I would look at Steve and I'd say, how well you're walking? How well you're breathing? How well your hands working? How well you're speaking? This is about when he was in the pool. What's your well-being? He was pretty happy. Um, he was actually renovating my carriage house and he won an award when he was in the state. So it was productive. But I wrote this down, I turned into numbers. And we actually built an enterprise around this idea that you can take someone's history, this is when he was healthy, when he was getting married, when he was on a ventilator, function time, different diseases have different progressions, different histories, but we don't really know them because we don't really measure them. Remember that, we don't really know because we don't really measure. One more time. We don't really know because we don't really measure. So here's this big website, 1,800 diseases, uh, three quarters of a million people, tracked all this stuff, largest sleep study ever done, all kinds of interesting stuff. But to me, that didn't actually solve my problem, but it did allow me to do, demonstrate something. So if you actually track someone, the phenotype, which is what we would call how they experience life, you can do something neat. So my brother had a stem cell transplant that I um, designed uh, back in 2000. And I never knew if it worked. We had three people, it was the first one in the field, we published it, showed that it was safe. Uh, it's autologous, we can cover the details later. But I never know if it worked. But I said, if I tracked all these people, imagine if I could tell a computer Peter, go and tell me about everyone in the world with the exact same disease as Stephen. So it picked all these people that were 10 years later, because the company was later. And it built this nice little algorithm, put them all in a row, built a control group just for him, and then draw the average of that control group. And 10 years after I gave him stem cell transplant, I found out he went exactly as expected. But no one had ever done that projection before. But you can build that prediction for anything, as long as you, was the word measure? Um, so I, I was thinking, how do we do this? And so we, now, patients like me is a hard business, um, because it turns out people don't necessarily want to know if things work in medicine. It's a whole other complication. So they, we pay, we charge them to do that, and we measure this stuff. But it, it's hard to do this really well. So the business helped a lot of people, but it was hard to make work as a business. But I did learn this one really important thing. After all this time, what mattered to me 
It was how quickly can I know if something worked in someone I loved? And that came down to figuring out how they were different from everyone else and how well you could measure that. Now this problem, I, I would argue, is the only problem that matters if you want to cure a disease. It doesn't matter if it's rare or a common one. In fact, HIV, fast measure, got cured. Not by the drugs, by the measure. Uh, insulin, you can taste it in the air, and that's when doctors really talk to other patients. Um, you know, Gleevec, that miraculously changed the course of CML, blood tests. Fast, rapid measures produce fast, rapid treatments. The problem is, is that we're all really different. And so everyone says, oh, you gotta run this double-blind thing where we isolate everyone and make them all different. And we completely do that, which is the way we run our lives, right? We always figure out how to compare cars and we only change the color to see if we like it better. Or we only change you know, our clothing fabric. Like, oh, I only wear polyester, but I can't change the color. That's the way we live life. We, we do everything in isolation, right? No, we don't. We, we integrate stuff. And in fact, you can't solve a disease in isolation because this is not an access of disease and health. Because I'm actually pretty healthy, but I also have an arrhythmia and I have asthma. So the reality is actually it's a two-axis thing. You have diseases and you have health, and they connect to each other. And sometimes, if you get healthier, you have less disease. Sometimes you get more. In the case of ALS, it turns out the way you prevent ALS is to smoke, be obese, and not exercise. That's how you get less ALS. Each of those is about 50% risk factor. So I, you know, these things have relationships, mathematical relationships. And then age comes in, which is a really annoying thing that I'm starting to experience and I don't want to anymore. And it like, makes things a little worse and things progress. And you can't get ALS without aging. It doesn't happen. You know, all kinds of diseases get aging. Do we understand aging? Do we understand health? Do we think we understand disease, even these little ones that we know with a single gene? Because they all interact, the whole thing, right? So here I am, fairly healthy, aging more than I want, it's a couple of diseases, and okay. You can probably all plot yourself on that, but imagine if the medical system actually plotted you. Like, you know, American Express or whatever, your credit score knows more about everything you do in the world, but you don't know, no one tracks you on this. And their friends run insurance companies, they have no idea how healthy their participants are. They're just guessing. So, um, I, I'm a huge fan of this guy. Um, 1800s, and this quote really sticks with me. All the properties of matter are so connected that we can scarcely imagine one thoroughly explained without it seeing its relation to all others without, in fact, having the explanation of all. So I would argue that if you have a rare disease, you can only solve it by knowing everything. You can only connect it. There are no more silos. Everything you do is in relation to everyone else. And so your responsibility, our responsibility, is connect everything in the same way, in the same measures. And the Industrial Revolution did that. When you had blacksmiths before, you couldn't buy a bolt and a nut from a single blacksmith and show them no, because they used different standards. But now we have one, two standards. Today, everything connects. And biology's getting there. We can print anything we want. We can measure anything we want increasingly in standard ways. We can put it in databases that make it comparable. We have reagents that are more and more reliable. This bubbling of improvement in quality means that suddenly everything can be connected and compared. So what do we do with that? Remember how I digitized mice and I measured all the RNA and we figured out one of the things that's causing the disease? We have more in the way. Why don't we digitize humans? And it's not genetics, it's where we are. Genetics is the business plan, it's important. I want to know my business plan, right? I really want to know where I am in the world. And every one of these things is involved in disease. Methylation, RNA, proteins, metabolites, lipids, mitochondria, antibodies, your innate immune response, cells and markers, bacteria, all of this long COVID, all these things are in here. But no one ever measures them all the same way, ever. Doesn't happen. Um, and then we have these traits. How healthy are you? What are your diseases? Your intervention. It's not some false isolation or silo with the connection of them. Well, I did measure them all. I ran a study about five years ago where I recruited a few thousand people and measured all of those things. And I started tracking them over time to see what would happen. And 
this came out of this idea that rather than saying, how do I change some abstract phenotype that I don't really understand with a single drug, how do we understand the relationship of biology to my experience and the relationship of treatment to biology, the full network, the understanding of the connection, the understanding of the language of life, which we don't use. No more cartoons, but the actual depth of it. So this is my age simulated from my blood by comparing on thousands of factors um, against a few thousand people. And you will see that I could guess my age at plus or minus one year over 24 samples. It's a really tight biomarker. I've actually not seen another biomarker that tight. Now, I want that to go down. I don't know about you. When I did it, BMI, which you'd think would be a little hard to guess, we could get it within like 5%. That's unoptimized and only on a few thousand samples. So if you measure everything, you get to the other side of this magical curve where you begin to understand life itself, which means your rarity is established in thousands of vectors, not one, not two, not five. This, I have a gene that causes a risk of Alzheimer's earlier, um, it's ABE4, I'm subject one. Um, and, uh, and I'm like, okay, forget everybody else in the world, just for me, which of my metabolites move in sync with ABE? So maybe I can adjust what I eat myself to adjust my ApoE protein level that is responsible to my ApoE gene. And that's the mathematics of comparing that at an individual. That's one person. Now, um, my company's called Alden Scientific. That's my um, oldest son, Alden. Um, and uh, I, I, it, it, it's an old word in Old English that means, sorry, old in English that means old friend. Um, and uh, why I have him there? Because he has, uh, like me, allergies uh, and asthma. Um, and he's been to the hospital a few times. He's an inhaler um, for that. Um, and I'm like, well, how, how do I cure Alden? Well, you know, I could give him steroids. And I could give him a ventilator and all the things that we do. Um, but what I could also do is figure out what makes him different from the Amish. Because I don't know about you, but I've never seen a drug that reduces a disease by 90%. 90%. So there is something in the way we live, the gestalt of life, our living, our environment, our food, our toxins, maybe our drugs, all of it, that can cure uh, my Alden. But we have to find it, which means we need to measure everything. So the dream I have, this industrialization, which is going to blow up everything, it's going to blow up discovery, it's going to blow up development, uh, it's going to hopefully blow up delivery, which I think is the worst of them. Um, and I want to imagine that it's going to build something different, something where we learn from every single person, from every single environment. We end up with health, not disease, not sick care, but health itself. Uh, and that's going to be the real revolution. And you know, how old is that iPhone in your pocket? 15 years? Remember the world before the iPhone? Remember the world before everything was connected? You guys remember maps? Like the, carrying a paper map, asking someone at a gas station where you are, like a doctor. Directions are sometimes good. Um, this is what I want. So I'm going to end with Kelvin. Um, in physical science, the first essential step in the direction of learning any subject is to find principles of numerical reckoning and with practicable methods for measuring some quality connected with it. I often say that when you can measure what you are speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. But when you cannot measure it, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. It may be the beginning of knowledge, but you have scarcely in your thoughts advanced to the state of science, whatever the matter may be. 
I would like to move from our meager and unsatisfactory knowledge into something that we can actually act upon and make a difference in me and my son Alden. Sadly, not for my brother Stephen, for all the people we love. And that could change the whole system. So thank you very much. It has been a pleasure speaking to you tonight. Thank you, Jamie. If you want to stay up here for a minute. Um, so we're going to have a panel discussion next. But while we're setting it up for the panel discussion, I just want Jamie to be able to answer a couple of questions. Love the references to Cal Lord Kelvin, but also to Proust. You know, the journey of discovery is, new yeah. New yeah, yeah, it requires new eyes, you know, and not a new landscape. And so let me just turn it to the audience, see if anybody has a question. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I love the idea of collecting so much data, and I think that has been the disruptive force for the tech industry as well. But I'm concerned about the privacy concerns that some people might have in sharing such a large amount of data about themselves. Do you have any ideas of how we can get around that? Um, yeah, I mean, privacy has been central to all of this. I mean, I, I, uh, so two quick comments. Um, first, I think we misunderstand privacy. So my experience at patients like me, what people want is not necessarily not to share information, but not to have information used against them. In fact, we used to joke in patients like me, if we could set the privacy setting, share my data with everyone in the world except my Facebook friends. <laughs> that was what people wanted. Because uh, they didn't want to talk about their illness with their friends, but they wanted to help everybody else. Now that's not everybody, but we don't need everybody. We just need a few people to do it. Um, and I, I think um, the second thing I said about privacy, uh, the evidence is that people want to share. When hospitals do true consents, they get 90% adoption and things like that. I think privacy is frankly used by the healthcare system and by the pharmaceutical industry as a way of maintaining the monopoly and preventing uh, just they don't, they don't want to be discovered in that context. And so I actually think it's a little bit of a red herring. Um, that said, um, you know, I, I think the more important thing is that we make the rules you can't discriminate against people, not that we punish them. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Again, Sheila. thank you so much for a wonderful talk. And uh, we will look forward to discussing more after the event. So next up, I think we have a really stimulating and eye-opening panel discussion. And the panel discussion is actually going to be something that we're going to delve into deeper detail about rare diseases. And we're doing that using different types of perspectives. So we're going to hear from Mete. Dyerberg, who is a CEO of MyMe, but also is a patient of an autoimmune disorder. Uh, we're going to hear from Paul Kruksa, who is a pediatrician, a physician, scientist, and chief medical officer of GeneDX. And we're going to also hear from Kami Molmadaze, and he is here um, also from, um, he is from, C he's a CEO of Arcadia, but also has a son, Luca, who actually suffers from a rare disease, an X-linked disorder, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And so you're going to share a perspective from the uh, eyes of a parent. And then we have my dear friend and colleague, uh, Lauren Rotolo, who is an author. She's an advocate, but also is a patient who has also a rare disease. And so I'd like to ask all of the panelists to come up to stage and join me. Paul, I'm going to start with you. So we talk about rare disease a lot. So what is the definition of rare disease? What is a rare disease? And is it really rare? Yeah. Well, the, you know, the Orphan Drug Act um, really was the first definition of a rare disease in the United States. It's an arbitrary number of there's less than 200,000 people that, that have it. But it, it, it turns out that a lot of diseases individually are rare, but when you put them all together, they're common. And I guarantee that everyone in this audience has someone in their neighborhood block, 
on their street or in their family that has a rare disease. There's 300 million people with rare disease. So collectively, it's, it's, it's really common. Um, and, and so that's, that's the definition of rare disease. I, I feel like that 200,000 may be arbitrary. And you know, there's a lot we don't know yet. I think there's, you know, when you start looking, there's probably a lot more people. Maybe they just haven't been diagnosed yet with a rare disease. Maybe it's that, that kid with autism and intellectual disability and seizures. Maybe no one's ever really looked into it. Um, so, um, you know, maybe we don't really know. Why is diagnosis such a problem? Uh, really, you're, you're, you're going to ruffle my feathers <laughs> right away. All right. Yeah. You know, it's um, things change. Yes. Things change quickly. The technology changes. Um, and the tools we have now, when, when I was a medical student, really the only genetic test was a karyotype. You know, you could diagnose Down syndrome, uh, Turner syndrome. And, uh, you know, there, there's this thing, there's this adoption curve, this technology adoption curve. You know, electric cars, for example, have been around for a long time. But it's just now we're starting to see them on our street. And so I feel one of the main barriers to diagnosis is that we just don't move fast enough. And, and there's a lot changing. I mean, this, this is the most exciting time in rare disease um, by far. Uh, the, the, the payers are coming around, whole genome sequencing, which means you sequence every base in your body. That's, they're paying for that now, Medicaid. The biggies, United Healthcare. Um, you know, the technology has been around for ten years, but it's you know things are changing. And to answer your question, the providers need to be ready for it. We need people out there to order the test. I challenge everyone here to go to their pediatrician. By the way, I'm a family physician, not a pediatrician. Go to your family physician and ask for a whole genome test. And I'll be like, what? What are you talking about? And what does it cost nowadays, whole genome sequence? Um, I'm going to give a rough number. Um, what does it cost to actually do, or what do people charge? I would say, let's just say it probably cost less than $1,000 to do one now. And I know there's some people in the audience I was having some drinks with from Illumina, um, you know, that we were talking about that the prices will continue to go down, down, and down. So that's where we're going. So Lauren, you are a patient, and you know I want to understand from your perspective. Not only are you a patient, you are an advocate. You know you are there actually, contributing <laughs> to research and driving you know the research. So tell us a little bit about your experience. What is it like to live with a rare disease? Um, so I tell people first and foremost that I don't know another life. This is I was diagnosed at two years old with my first symptoms at nine months old. Um, but it's basically living a life where you are consistently learning, but also teaching. So, for example, I have McCune-Albright syndrome, whereas I assume that nobody in this audience has ever heard of it. There are maybe less than 5,000 people in the United States with it. And I will go to the best medical institutions out there, and they say, yes, I've heard of that, but I've never met anybody with it. Or I had to learn that from my board. So I guess that's a board disease. Like, and <laughs> I'm sure you've heard that before. Um, but you're constantly having to teach people every single day about what, you're, what the inside of you is and how it affects you. And you almost become a doctor and a researcher and a scientist because you know yourself best and if nobody is really doing enough research because let's just be honest it also comes down to money and not everybody can raise such money that they are able to cure or create a treatment for people so you're constantly not only learning about yourself and what comes next but then having to teach people and having then to not only teach, but then for myself, I believe that 
my disease was given to me as a gift. So while I can sit here and have the disease and talk to you all or live a great life, I also want to show the world that you can live with a rare disease and you can be successful and you can live in New York City and you can write a book and you can do whatever you want even though the world is constantly treat you as an unknown and they treat you as you know somebody that is different. So it's a life of adventure. <laughs> and Lauren, in all the time I've known you and we've traveled together far and wide, including Davos, one of the hardest places to kind of navigate and you've sort of shown up there, the disease hasn't defined you, uh, but you wanna make sure that you know, the world knows what this is all about, right? Yeah. Yes. So, Cami, um, you know, you have the experience from a parent's perspective. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, this disease uh, that your son has. It's o only four people have actually been diagnosed with this disease. And what is it like living as a parent? Um, I have the second part. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> overwhelming. Uh, that should be <laughs> I'm sure it'll come at some point. <clears throat> but it's also very inspiring. It can be confusing. It can be overwhelming. It can be scary. Um, there's no handbook. But it can also be very inspiring. And you meet a lot of parents who've done some unbelievable things for their kids. And uh, you draw inspiration from that. It can be very educational, as you mentioned. Um, and, you know, you try to do not just what's right for your kid, but other kids with the same disease, but also the broader rare disease community. And there's a lot of lessons learned from our journey. We work actually very closely with Paul and his group. Um, and, you know, one of the things I've noticed is early detection, early detection, early detection is very important. Um, Saving your assets is very important. Your fibroblast, your, uh, all your pre-treatment mm -hmm. uh, disease cells. Um, but also getting payers involved. And so how do you do that? There's a bit of a chicken and egg and getting these. Um, they're rare because people don't know that other people might have them. And the reason they don't know is because you don't test. And the reason you don't test is because you don't pay. Or people don't pay for the test or payers don't pay. So getting pathogenic designation, getting um, functional studies to enable pathogenic designation, which will then lead to payers paying for tests, will make um, the commercial viability of this stuff uh, a lot more realistic for even a rare disease foundation, forget a commercial entity. Uh, in terms of our son, he has a, a rare X-linked mutation, missense, um, that impacts a protein that's used uh, by uh, something called a proton pump, a VTPase complex. Uh, and historically, this protein in the scientific literature was known as something called a proretin receptor. But I think uh, as time has gone on and molecular structures are able to be better studied and understood, um, it turns out that it plays an important role in assembling this proton pump, which plays in turn plays an important role in protein synthesis as well as something called autophagy and protein elimination. So I can go on <laughs> forever, but basically it's a protein synthesis um, and a waste elimination uh, disease. And if you're not, uh, if you don't manage it, it could lead to all kinds of neurological as well as immunological as well as metabolic uh, disorders. So, I mean, as a parent, um, what advice do you have for other parents? Because, you know, many, many, many rare diseases are diagnosed, you know, in, in children, right? I mean, how do you know? And how do you know what to do? Well, that's the problem. I mean, we got lucky. We, uh, we happened to stumble on a pediatric hepatologist who suggested that we screen for a CD. So the disease is classified as something called congenital disorder glycosylation, so CDG. It turns out that it's not really a CDG. It's a downstream consequence. Uh, is, is CDG, but um, you know, early detection is really, really important, and I can't emphasize the importance of genetic testing enough. Um, and as I think the previous speaker spoke very elo eloquently, we're still missing genotype-phenotype correlations, um, and that's something as a community, I think the rare disease community needs to advance because that'll get 
providers involved, it'll get payers involved, uh, it'll get other parents involved, it'll get foundations involved. Um, but you know, my advice would be early detection. You want to, uh, Paul likes to use the term um, the di proverbial diagnostic desert, um, where you don't, you know, you don't want to be wandering for years, wondering, wondering what happened. Um, there's also, you know, there there aren't a lot of like in cancer and oncology, there aren't a lot of navigation guides, but there are some. Uh, Mark Veitch introduced me to a company, um, a Global Gene, that has a division called RareX that actually has a pre-diagnosis to post-detection uh, navigation uh, service, if you will. Um, and then the other thing I would say is community. Community really matters. Going to these rare disease boot camps with other parents, learning from other people's journeys, from their successes, as well as some of their setbacks, um, flattening those learning curves as much as possible. All of that matters. Thank you. Mete, your company, MyMe, is focused on autoimmune disorders. I mean, tell me a little bit about it and how is it connected to rare diseases? It's connected in the sense that most autoimmune patients sometimes feel like they're rare diseases themselves in the sense that you have your own unique experience, right? Yeah. And so while not all autoimmune diseases are seen as, as rare today, I feel like every person is going through their own journey. Um, I myself have six diagnoses, and it's 25% of everyone with an autoimmune disease that collects more than one diagnosis. Um, you asked earlier, Paul, around what does it mean to get a diagnosis? And in our space, it takes five to seven years to get to diagnosis. Wow. And that's just the first sort of step into any sort of direction. Then you have to fail metrotrexate to even get to the quote unquote good drugs, and the good drugs fail four out of five people. Wow. So you're really on a journey that while you don't necessarily qualify as a rare disease, it can feel quite lonely and quite uh, scary to go down that path. Um, the, the one thing about diagnosis that's really intriguing when we're talking about up against the drug space is that getting a diagnosis and matching that with the drug is one thing, but a well-known hospital here in New York have actually seen that in the five-year study of autoimmune diagnoses, 76% of the patients change diagnosis. And why does that happen? It's because there's no drugs for the existing diagnosis. So what are we doing, right? We're basically trying to map it out. And so when Jamie says earlier, measure what matters, that's really what it's down to still. So, you know, what do you do while you're wandering around, like looking for a diagnosis? You know, if it takes five or six years to really figure out what's, you know, what's wrong? Steadily, most people get more and more sick, right? And so, unfortunately, by the time of diagnosis, people's health have declined. It has typically been a diagnosis since people first time felt something. Um, I was sick for 20 years before I sort of got on the path of figuring out what was going on. And so in MIME, what we do is we're working predominantly with the non-responders in the rheumatic autoimmune and rheumatic COVID space. And for our population, it really comes down to triggers, identifying what is triggering your autoimmune system to sort of, quote unquote, get confused and attack itself. And if we can pinpoint that, we can actually reverse disease symptoms and slow disease progression. But it's Again, back to Jamie's, it's unique. It's about measuring what matters, and it's about pinpointing for the individual. What does this look like for you? That's um, really interesting. I mean, what is the future, though, of diagnostics? Because you know, it seems like that's so key, and it takes such a long time. And because rare diseases are so diverse, I mean, you're talking about 7,000 different types of diseases, right? Like, how do you solve a big problem like that, Paul? Um, well, if, if we're talking about genetic diseases, um, well, first of all, I, would, I just yeah. want to acknowledge there's a theme here yeah. with, with everyone on the stage of this concept of diagnostic odyssey. When your symptoms begin to, someone really figures out what's what going is, on. Yeah. And, and until you get that diagnosis, once you get that diagnosis, then, like Cami said, you find community you can start focusing your energy towards um, therapies. Um, so that period from when 
you first start having symptoms or someone feels you, you, you might have some type of um, disease until it's the diagnosis, that's called the diagnostic odyssey. Mm -hmm. And the, your, the number you, you used was perfect, five to seven years. A lot of people quote that number, five to seven years. How do we, how do we get that? Um, that's really a lot of us in the rare disease space, that's what we do. Like our whole reason for, being, for existing professionally is to, is to shorten that diagnostic odyssey because a lot of times there's a lot of harm mm -hmm. or you, you miss out on a lot of therapies in those years. And um, um, one, one project that we're doing with Wenny Chung, she's a physician here in New York City at Columbia University, is a study called Guardian, where we're sequencing children at birth, newborn screening for rare diseases. Um, currently, the, 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 the US government, um, Health and Human Services recommends 36 diseases to be screened for us on the RUSP the recommended uniform screening panel, we're increasing that to hundreds of mm -hmm. different conditions using whole yeah. genome sequencing and a backbone and figuring this out on birth. And we're going to, re uh, Wendy's going to release some really interesting data at the American College of Medical Genetics in a few weeks. But um, to give a preview is you, you can shorten the diagnostic odyssey really to, to birth. And there, there's... Do I have time to just talk about one example? Yeah, yes, please do, yes. So, okay, there's one condition that, that is called GLUT1 deficiency that we, that's on this, this, uh, this, this um, panel. panel. Yeah. And it can be almost cured just with diet. It's that simple. It, it's, a, it's a transporter, glucose transporter for the brain. And the average age of diagnosis, we have almost 100 patients at GeneDx that have been diagnosed is about 10 years of age. So you've missed all these IQ points over those 10 years. So I, I just love this example, but that spells it out. Let's get rid of that diagnostic odyssey. It's getting, like you said, you asked me how, how expensive. This is getting less and less expensive. Who cares about costs anyways, right? If we yeah. can do it, the, the, the long run costs I'm sure would be saved. Let's, let's do this. Yes. Let's get rid of this odyssey, this diagnostic odyssey. So speaking of that, you know, so on the one hand, yes, we want to reduce the diagnostic odyssey, partly because there may be, in some cases, an immediate solution available. But what if there isn't? I mean, how do you as a parent and you as a patient, you know, go through that sort of odyssey knowing that maybe there is no answer? And, and how do you keep the hope up? What is your wish? Lauren? I mean, I'm in my 40s, and I can say that there is there's still no answer. You know, there are some indications of other disease, of other treatments that I have used, but there is not one. And I don't know in my lifetime if I will ever see that, to be honest. And so it's a scary world that you go into. And, you know, the promise of a lot of people with my disease have a huge amount of pain and I'm thankful due to working out and things that I do that I don't have as much pain but you know people suffer so much and when they're suffering so much and they may have you know like I have early onset arthritis because of my disease now I have to treat the doctors will go and treat arthritis but did they know that when I was diagnosed 45 years ago no, they didn't, so they didn't treat that. And even, you know, I'm part of a study, uh, a natural history study at the NIH where they have been following me for years. And so they'll say all of a sudden, oh, we know that you could have, you know, pancreatitis with this disease, so let's test you for pancreatitis. But so it's a constant journey and you don't know what's gonna hit at what time. And I think that that is the hardest part of it is that you, you never know how the disease is constantly going to transform into something else. And as you age with it, it, it changes. And a lot of people don't know that. You know, aging is a huge issue with rare, with rare diseases. Um, that's a great answer. Um, <laughs> it's a real answer. <laughs> I guess I would, uh, I'll give you a philosophical answer and then I'll, rely, can, I'll do something Jamie said. 
Uh, it all depends on how you measure success, right? So as rare disease parents, my wife and I are doing all the things you'd you know, expect, suspect, research, SRAs, mouse models, you know, different cell models, IPSC lines, all that stuff. Um, and the way I look at it is if the, the, our worst case outcome is we learn something and the next person comes along. Mm -hmm. That's not a horrible place to be. Yep. Medium case outcome, we help four kids. It happens that this disorder is implicated in a bunch of different other neurological and, and, uh, and immunological diseases. And so best, best case outcome, we have you know, cro adaptability to something else. So for, for us, if we just move the knowledge forward, it's, it's a win. Um, number two, something Jamie said that stuck with me, you know, he, tr he turned over 250 stones until he found what he was looking for. Um, and part of the answer to your earlier question, you gotta go down every rabbit hole. You have to go down every rabbit hole. The things you wind up thinking you learned but that you weren't looking for, like we were talking to a glycosylation expert, she just won the Nobel recently at Stanford, and she, we were expecting her to talk about one thing and she put us in a completely different direction. And was like, yeah, I know you're here because you think I know a lot about this, but you should be focused on the lysosomes. Um, and you just don't know. Yeah. You have to mm -hmm. turn over every stone. And um, you know, I kind of think about this, he called it industrialization. There, we're definitely living in a biotech 3.0 mo uh, moment. You know, the confluence of sequencing and therapy and bioinformatics and computational biology and stem cells, all this stuff, is creating some of the stuff I'm seeing for not just rare diseases, but single point gene rewriting technologies that a lot of stuff that Deerfield's involved with is pretty, pretty amazing what the next 10 to 15 years I think hold for us. I'm very optimistic, um, for our situation aside, but for the broader community, I think what we're gonna see the next 10 to 15 years, just even reading these scientific uh, research papers over the last you know, 10, 15 years ago, the pace of innovation was much, the slope of the curve was much flatter um, 10, 15 years ago than the last five years. And I think there's a lot of promise ahead for this can, community. Can I add one thing to that? Is you said the active community. And I think that when people think about community, for me is the gathering of people that live with this disease like I do. And so what I have done as an advocate is try to get patients together to talk about what is their daily life like? What is their pain like? What other symptoms are they having? Because these are the things that the doctors and the scientists and the researchers are not living, are not thinking about because they actually don't live with it. And so when you live with something, if you gather the data of just and have a real conversation with the patients that live with it, a lot of research can happen based on that. And I am one of those where I've brought a conversation to gynecologists around the country. And now people with my disease are having that same conversation. And there are you know, treatments that can treat specifically just that. Yeah. And so I That's think conversation and yes. unlocking things unlocking is really important. Things and bringing the, you know, the whole patient population with similar you know, symptoms and disease, I think is really imp important. But sometimes you may not have a diagnosis, but you have symptoms, right? I mean, how do you deal with that, especially like in autoimmune diseases? So, so we use the body signaling or the symptoms to really correlate between what is it that I do on a daily basis and how is the causality with how it, it, it shows up in my symptoms. And that is really how we pinpoint the triggers. I think following the symptoms back to measure what matters, right? It's like that's the holy grail of, of what we do. Yeah, and we're gonna listen uh, to you and do you doing a demo of the app that you, know, you have developed uh, you know, as part of MyMe and we're gonna see that. I wanna make sure, so two things, first of all, some of you are wearing your stripes, <laughs> showing your stripes, and we're showing our colors as well today. And I don't know if you can see, maybe the panelists can't see, but everybody should turn around and look at the Empire State Building. It's lit up in Rare Disease Day colors. And 
I think that some people out there or our neighbors may be looking at this rooftop room here and saying, hey, look at those colors lit up in rare disease colors. So, you know, um, we're, we're, we're showing our colors and sharing, you know, our stripes to make sure that we're honoring the, not just the patients who are living with the disease, but also their families and their caregivers and the people who are working, racing against the clock, you know, for diagnosis and, and treatment. I want to turn it to the audience because in addition to the audience here, we have an audience actually on our webcast. So I know we're sort of running out of time, but maybe we'll take one or two questions. Yes. Hi. Um, there was an article, it was actually today, uh, this morning in, on the BBC website. Um, it was called, oops, sorry about that. It, it was, it's called The Search for the World's Missing Genome. And the point of the article was that we think we know a lot about the human genome, but actually what we really know a lot about is the genomes of people who are fairly affluent, mostly of European descent, and who live around major medical centers because that's where research gets done. So there's a whole lot of people that are not represented very well in the databases that we used as references for for a lot of this research. So I'm just wondering, I mean, since I came up this morning, um, if, if, if uh, any of you could ad address that question of how do we expand our knowledge of actual humanity? Anyone want to take that? I have a, I have a friend in London, mm -hmm. and their company basically has on a, um, more like a donation base, actually um, sequenced a lot of uh, Asian and Indian DNA from different populations because his brother had a disease and they realized that all the medication was done up against a white affluent European man and uh, that his brother did not belong in that group. And so they've done thousands of genetic tests, uh, but probably more now, um, as a result of that, seeing that there was, a, there was a hole. But I don't know where it has landed overall in the market. Maybe Paul knows better. Yeah, um, th that is a problem. A lot of the, the studies traditionally have been in, in Western countries. And so there's differences, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa um, that we're, we're not going to see. And as you know, there's this, there's this concept um, of polygenic risk score. So we're, we're, we're starting to study common diseases and genetics, just not the rare diseases yeah. that, we, that we're talking about today and advocating for today. And unless we have that database, because if we just look at a Western population, maybe a, a predominantly white population, those tools are not going to work in Sub-Saharan Africa or other places of the world. For I'm just using Sub-Saharan Africa as an example. So yes, there is an effort. We need to know, like, like this gentleman said, the entire genome of the world for sure. Um, there was an effort um, in Africa led by the African Academy of Sciences in conjunction with the National Human Genome Research Institute, part of NIH, that began pre-pandemic, but then when the pandemic started, everything kind of, so I don't know if that's being revived or not, but that was an effort to actually, the, it was called the African Genome Project to really do exactly that. And, Thankfully, now we have a little bit more women represented uh, from a gender perspective, uh, thanks to, again, um, the NIH Office of Women's um, Research that sort of started down this trajectory. But, but, but I think that this is a question that is key um, amongst a lot of people um, who are trying to solve this riddle. And I think collecting the data from even communities of color um, is going to be something that requires, it's not just the science, it's going to require, you know, creating trust and figuring out, you know, many, many other socioeconomic things that we need to, you know, solve in order to be able to do that. Um, I know we're really out of time and we want to make sure that, um, you know, we give Mete a chance to show off uh, the app, uh, My Me app. And so I want to thank you all very much for you know, a really inspiring panel and uh, for, you know, being able to teach us, but also, you know, able to talk to us as to what, you know, you individually are going through. So thank you all very thank much. You. Great. Thank you. And Mete, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, okay. Leave the stage and 
uh, you are going to walk people through my, the MyMe app, and we're um, looking forward to. We are actually going to do a two-minute video from the past because I just had a baby a couple of weeks ago, and sort of trying to still. Uh, Hi, my name is Metza Dyerberg. I'm the founder and CEO of MyMe. See those photos up there? That was me 20 years ago. Yes, me. In my early 20s, I got extremely ill. I went from working as a model to being unable to walk to a casting. I got diagnosed with six autoimmune conditions by the age of 30. I saw numerous doctors. I was heavily medicated, but nothing helped. So I took matters into my own hands and I hacked my own health. It's called my me. It's all about taking yourself back. My me. Autoimmunity is when your immune system gets confused and attacks itself. In our parents' generation, it impacted one in 400. In ours, it's one in five. Millions are spending years suffering because medication fails three out of four. Today, autoimmune diseases is the leading cause of death for women aged 15 to 49. But Miami is here to combat these diseases and help the sick reclaim their health. Miami is a clinically validated program that helps reduce autoimmune disease symptoms in more than 90% of the members. Our approach consists of three key elements. A mobile app that has a snap to track feature. So all you have to do is take a quick photo of what you eat and drink. So you tap and that's it. We take the body signaling and we turn that noise into understanding by pinpointing the causality between what you do and how it manifests in your symptoms. Our approach is led by certified health coaches that are able to transform these machine learnings into a personalized plan. Your coach will help you avoid triggers and make these small doable changes over time. I'm healthier in my 40s than I was in my 20s and 30s. What took me 16 months, we can now do for others in 16 weeks. I was able to change my life, and now we're changing lives of others around the world. I would get bruises everywhere and just not feel good and have to go to the hospital. I have problems with pain, I have problems with walking. Feeling like I had the flu coming on all the time. I developed numbness in the right side of my body that was so severe that when it came time to get out of bed in the morning, I could not even move. All that changed when I started Miami. Within four weeks of starting the Miami program, all of the pain and all of the numbness was gone. I was able to get my health back and she saved my life. I can now go fishing with my husband. It's been just a fantastic discovery and I am so thankful for my me and the program. So while this feels a little bit more like an infomercial <laughs> than, than necessarily, in some ways, the reason I picked it was because from the outside, it all looks like just another digital health app. And no matter what disease or where on your journey you are, it all sort of comes across as similar. But where it all comes back to is why we all unique and why we all need different solutions. So MyMe, if I actually plotted it up here, would basically start from zero. When you download the app and enter the program, you don't get something that's already pre-made where you select different things and it comes up. It's tailored, so we call it from zero to one. It basically gets built as you're going through the journey. It's not just who you are, but it's how you talk about yourself. It's how you experience life that gets reflected. When we're talking about Miami and it being a reflection of yourself, it matters how you see yourself. If I am asking you to do pain from one to five, what is that worth at the end of the day? But if I, in a study of, with Cornell University, we were looking at pain and we were trying to establish what it meant to the individual. And for an RA patient, mild could be achy joints, moderate could be mobility issues, and severe could be I can't get out of bed. It's a very discrete measure. And once you have that, then you can start correlating up against what do you do on an everyday basis. Um, I was lucky. My trigger is chicken. 
I couldn't walk. Now I don't eat chicken. I'm perfectly fine. However, getting pregnant, I learned what it's like to be our patients. Because for many, it's histamine, it's nightshades, it's things they don't even know what is. And navigating that world, sitting at a restaurant, looking forward to a meal, and then Googling it going, oh, yeah, that's not going to work. That's actually what it's like. So it feels like you're stumbling through life. And what we are trying to do is we can't take the burden of having these incurable diseases, but being symptom-free, being able to take back control and being able as a mother to not have to spend all of your life sort of navigating a minefield, but knowing what it is. Knowing that if I have to be up at that graduation the next day, I know I can avoid these different things. I also know when I flare why that is. But understanding what the minefield looks like means you have a playbook. And so from our perspective, it really comes back to measure what matters. Understand what it looks like so that you can navigate in your world. And so I think from my perspective, I obviously right now everything is surrounding the pregnancy, right? But I got pregnant in the first try at 46. And my doctors were like, we don't see that. And I'm like, probably because in New York, you tell people from 35 it's not possible. But if your body is actually tuned up, I'm sorry, but we tune our cars. We do all these other things. But when it comes to health, we don't actually look at ourselves through that lens very often. And MIME is here to help people take that burden out so that they can focus on living. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mete. Uh, that was great. That's wonderful. I mean, we had no idea that you had a baby three weeks ago. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank That's thank wonderful. You. Wonderful. Thank you. Congratulations. So that's great. That's a great way to, to end the evening. And thank you so much for joining us. Great. So we're going to end the evening with a trailer of an award-winning winning film, I should say. Uh, it's a documentary. It's called Undiagnosed. And it chronicles the journey of four families who are on a quest to diagnose what is ailing their children. And so we're going to watch a trailer. It's actually on tour now. And the movie is going to be um, in, you know, in theaters probably in the next year or so. So let's watch. Happy birthday to you, dear. Hope you have a sunshiny day and a happy life. I love you. was born, there was nothing unusual that the doctors noticed about him. They'd all kind of written me off as this crazy mother that was just trying to push through the system because nothing was happening. Time is ticking and Lily's getting older. Many people refer to his journey in the last 15 years as the climb of his life. I realized there are so many others out there dealing with life and death situations. He had a seizure. By the time I got to the hospital, they said he had three more in the ambulance. We're kind of going in blind. Managing hope is really a big part of living undiagnosed. When I first met Katya, that was the first time actually that I had the definition of undiagnosed. Without a diagnosis, these patients don't have any medical home. They don't have any support network. There are so many needless bits of suffering, missed opportunities to discover. We're not learning. We're not a learning healthcare system. The undiagnosed disease population provides such precious, important information. He's clearly hyperreflexic. It really will take a village for us to create a better system to diagnose patients. A goo is the best, oh, a goo is the best, oh, a goo is the best in the world. I miss home, but there's a feeling in my bones like a part of me don't know. But so when you have a diagnosis, it makes you part of a community. And we know that. Patients 
who are diagnosed even with bad disorders are very altruistic. They want to help others, and that becomes a part of their life, a part of their life's meaning. I know some of you have traveled far and wide, you know, so I really appreciate everybody coming. We've been through a lot, so you know, we can help you toward the long term. This is like the future of medicine right, right here. right here. We're going to learn more about ourselves than we ever have. We realize that collaboration plus new technologies equaled hope. So it's directed by Katya Moritz and Nicholas Miller, and uh, we're showing this in partnership with uh, Fire Films, and uh, it's now on the awards circuit, um, being shown in you know various different um, film festivals, and soon to be in theaters. So um, again, we thank Fire Films for letting us show this trailer. Um, thank you all very much for being here, for helping us like recognize and honor Rare Disease Day, and uh, for all your engagement. Thank you all.